Plan Colombia is an aid package that is sent every year to Colombia. The funding for the plan is divided in two, military aid and humanitarian aid. The program started in the year 2000 and was meant to last for six years. In the year 2006, it was renewed and it is still active. The main reason Plan Colombia was created was to support the central government of Bogota in the fight against drugs. Cocoa cultivation in the country was hitting historical records. This, together with the production of heroin, was putting the country in real risk of becoming a failed state. Plan Colombia is full with vague goals. Impost improve security, strengthen the judicial system, increase government responsiveness. In the document there is, however, a sentence that defines a quantifiable goal for the plan. Over the next six years, the goal is to reduce the cultivation, processing and distribution of narcotics by 50%. When the United States was considering involvement in Plan Colombia, many American politicians feared that the country was getting into another Vietnam War. A long war without clear end in a tropical country fighting against a guerrilla. In order to avoid a spiraling involvement in the Colombian War, the American Congress included a set of conditions to plan Colombia. It capped the number of American soldiers that could be in Colombia to 500. It also capped the number of American contractors to 300. It established a firewall between the fight against drugs and the fight against insurgent groups. Plan Colombia's money could never be used to fight against insurgents. It was only meant for the fight against drugs. This graph shows the funding for Plan Colombia. Between 2000 and 2008, my source here is the Government Accountability Office, part of the U.S. government. The year with the highest funding is 2000, the first year of the plan, with a billion dollars. Later, the value stabilized around $700 million per year. The war in Colombia can be understood as a confrontation between three opposing sides. The National Army, controlled by the central government, FARC, Fuerzas Armadas Revolucionarias de Colombia, a left-wing guerrilla organization that aims to overthrow the government and its finance, largely by drug money, the AUC, Auto Defensas Unidas de Colombia, an umbrella term for the dozen of paramilitary groups that fight the guerrillas with support of some sectors of the National Army. This group also draws most of its funding from the cocaine trade. To understand the complexity of the Colombian conflict, it is useful to make a distinction between an insurgency and a drug cartel. An insurgency is a highly hierarchical organization. It has the desire to change the fundamental political and economic relationships in the society. It normally has a charismatic leader, which is irreplaceable. Examples of this are Castro, Mao, or Lenin. When the leader is killed, the whole insurgency disbands. A drug cartel is also highly hierarchical. It may have political speedovers, like political assassinations, or increasing insecurity. However, a drug cartel does not have political aims. It does not try to change the fundamental relations in society. It has a strong leader. But the main difference between a cartel and an insurgency is that the leader is replaceable. If the leader is killed instead of destroying the cartel, new, smaller cartels are created. Middlemen in the cartel now fight for supremacy, increasing violence instead of reducing it. Using these two extremes, we can create a continuous variable. A good place FARC somewhere in the middle. FARC behaves sometimes like a cartel and sometimes like an insurgency. In a similar analysis, we could place the paramilitary groups closer to the right. They behave more like a, like a cartel. The hybrid character of FARC is what makes them so dangerous. On one hand, you have the command of the organization, composed by the older members, highly politicized and with an extremist agenda. On the other hand, you have the base of the organization, young insurgents, as young as 12 years old, with very little political education. This base of the organization behaves like a drug cartel. 
The drug money made Colombia one of the most dangerous places on earth. The graph shows the number of kidnappings per year. The year 1999 was the worst for the country, with close to 3,000 kidnappings. The majority for ransom, but a large number for political reasons. It is in this gloomy landscape of insecurity and drug money that Andres Pastrana wins the presidential election of 1998. As soon as he becomes president, he starts peace negotiations with FARC. FARC put as conditions for the peace talks to demilitarize an area of 40,000 square kilometers in the south of the country. The area is, highly, is highlighted in yellow. The demilitarized area was the size of Switzerland or that of Massachusetts and Connecticut put together. The peace talks began in October 1998. Sadly, the peace talks ended in a huge fiasco. After four years of political stalemate, Pastrana ordered the army to enter the area. Parallel to the peace talks, Pastrana negotiated with the Clinton administration Plan Colombia. But it was too late for Pastrana. By the time the plan's money started to arrive to Colombia, Pastrana was finishing his term. He left the office with an approval rate of 20%. In 2002, Alvaro Uribe wins the presidential election. As soon as Uribe takes office, the security situation in the country starts to improve. The number of homicides in the country started to decline. The number of kidnappings declined sharply, from 3,000 kidnappings in 2000 to about 100 in 2007. Traveling by land in the country was extremely dangerous. After Uribe takes office, the number of riders in Colombian roads increases substantially. The improvement in security brought economic development. In the year 2002, the start of the Uribe presidency, the GDP per capita was $2,300. By the end of the Uribe period, the GDP per capita was more than $6,000. That is almost a threefold increase in the per capita income of the country. The important improvements in security and in the economy created a myth around Uribe. During his presidency, he reached approval rates of 90% and left office with a healthy 70% approval rate. It will be unfair, however, to give all the credit to Uribe. In 2001, George W. Bush won the election against Al Gore. He came to office with a more interventionist view on foreign policy than his predecessor, Bill Clinton. Also, the money for Plan Colombia was already negotiated and was being disbursed to the Colombian government, playing also in favor of Uribe were the events of September 11. The terrorist attacks triggered the war on terror. The war on terror was very important because it made the U.S. leave the firewall that existed between the war on drugs and the fight against insurgent groups. It gave a free hand to Uribe. But what about the production of cocaine? Remember the goal of reducing coca production by 50% in, in, in six years? This question is hard to answer, as it depends on who do you ask. If you ask the Office of National Drug Control Policy, part of the U.S. government, it will tell you that Plan Colombia's only quantified objective was not met. In fact, the hectares of coca increased by 15% between 2000 and 2006. But if you use the United Nations Office on, on Drugs and Crime data, Plan Colombia has met its objectives. Between 2000 and 2006, the hectares with coca were reduced by 52%. And Colombia is still fighting, fighting with American money, the never-ending war on drugs, sacrificing thousands of Colombian lives every year to keep cocaine away from American nostrils.